I want you to imagine for a moment that you, uh, you find a ring and you discover that the ring has extraordinary power. In fact, it's a ring that if you twist it on your finger, you become invisible. How would you use that kind of a power? Would you use your newfound power of invisibility to do good? Or would you use it to do bad things, to commit unjust acts? The ring makes you invisible, right? So you're going to be protected from the consequences of your actions. Who are you when nobody can see you? Who are you when nobody is looking? Doing wrong and then hiding from the consequences goes back a long way, goes back even to the very beginning of the human race, goes back to the first couple, right? Adam and Eve who eat from the forbidden tree, they lose their innocence, their eyes are open, and immediately they start to hide. First, they hide from one another by covering themselves up. And then in a further attempt to cover up, they try to hide from God. Why be good? Why do good? Especially if nobody is watching. Is it to receive a reward or is it to avoid punishment? Why be good? Last week set the table for discussion over the coming weeks about uh, uh, what is generally called ethics, uh, Christian morality. Why, why be good is what the, what the question boils down to. And some, some believers suggest that the reason that uh, we should live according to Christian values is because that's the best way. That's the happiest way for anybody, even if you're even if you're not a believer, even if you're not a Christian, it's the best life for anybody, for everybody. In other words, even if you're not concerned about uh, salvation or you're not concerned about condemnation, the happiest life, the best life, will be one that is consistent with uh, Christian morality. It's just like, what's the saying? Honesty is the best policy. And so Christian ethics usually produces the best consequences and the deepest happiness. That's one reason. But being good is not just about living a happy life. Being good is, is not just about living an easy life. In fact, to be good is who we are made to be. It's our purpose. And so the question, why be good, is not to answer, well, just so we can be happy, so we can live an easy life. There's a deeper question we need to ask. What are we made for? What are we made to be? And there's a big difference between doing something to be happy and doing something because it is right. Doing something because that's what we are made for. And the word from Scripture is that the ultimate end toward which all creation is pointed is God. As Augustine wrote in his autobiographical work, Confessions, more than 1,600 years ago, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. In other words, humans created in the image of God have this innate longing. There is something in us. There is this yearning for something eternal. There is this, there is this desire, and sometimes we, we, we don't even recognize it. Sometimes we don't know what we're looking for, but there, there is something that we are trying to find that is truly fulfilling. And that's because we are created, all human beings are created in the image of God. 
And that image, even though it's been marred and scarred by sin, remains the goal. And it's evident when God, to the ancient Israelites, issues his holiness laws, and he prefaces the commands, all the commands, and he prefaces, and he says, the reason why it's best for you to follow these commands is because I want you to be holy like I am holy. And that verse is actually quoted in the New Testament for Christians in 1 Peter, uh, that we, uh, the reason for our Christian pursuit of holiness is because God is holy. And when God calls us to become holy, what what that boils down to is God is calling us to be like him, to reflect his image that we are created in. The end goal of reflecting the image of God, being like God, if you want to put it that way, that's the primary motivating factor for us to live the way that we live as children of God. We are, Paul says, to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And he points out to the Corinthians that the Christian walk is about imitating Christ. The life of discipleship is following the example of Christ. And so the reason for pursuing the good The reason for pursuing the good challenges the rationale that you want to be good because being good will make you happy. Being good will give you an easy life. If the reason for the good life is a pleasant, happy life, then uh, that will usually be the result, often is the result, of the Christian life, but as Jesus makes very clear, the Christian code of life is not a call to honesty or integrity even when things are easy. It's a call to self-sacrificial love for God and for others. It's a call to suffering, to taking up the cross and following Jesus. There's nothing wrong with being happy. But followers of Christ are not called to the easy, happy life, at least as the world defines it. We are being called to something greater, something deeper, something better. For a believer who is committed to following the way of Jesus, the way of the cross and resurrection, self-giving love is the best life. So how should we, as followers of Jesus, pursue holiness? How how do we attain or or strive for that goal of, of becoming more like God? There is a big difference, I think, between doing something because we want to be happy or or because whatever we're doing will make us happy and doing something because it's right, because that's what we're made for. And the word from Scripture is that the ultimate end toward which all creation is pointed is God. But how can we reflect the likeness and the goodness of our Creator and the Heavenly Father in all that we say and do. What criteria or standards should motivate our good acts? What makes an act good? Is it because it makes me happy? Is it because it has good outcomes? What makes something good? Some focus almost exclusively on the effects or the consequences, the outcomes of an action, uh, to judge whether it's right or wrong. Uh, if, If something good comes out of it, then that must be right. Others focus more on the action itself, An example of this may be uh, the Ten Commandments or the commands of Jesus. They don't always uh, talk about, uh, you know, if you follow this command, you're going to have a happy and good life. 
lots of times there's no mention of uh, the consequences of following or obeying the commands. They are to be followed regardless of whether they make you happy or not. And so some say it's the action itself that makes it good. And finally, some focus on the motivation behind an action to assess whether it's good. If we concentrate on being righteous people, the right actions will follow. In other words, it's the motivation, and people with the right character tend to make the right decisions. It's the motivation behind the act. And this focus on motivation behind an action, I think is seen in, in a lot of the teachings of Jesus. Think of the Sermon on the Mount, I may be the prime example, where Jesus is always pointing, right? He's getting to the motivations of the heart with regard to what we do. And so the act of murder begins with hate. The act of adultery begins with lust. And elsewhere, he says that what flows into our hearts and flows out of our hearts makes you clean or unclean. What's happening inside? What's the motivation? And the focus here is on the character that is produced in people. And the question is not simply about the virtue of a particular act, but about the motivation behind those acts. My conduct and, my, and the consequences can be good, but what motivates me can be sinful. Let me give you an example from Scripture. In uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, the church in Rome, he addresses the question, uh, the debate, the dispute within that church about eating meat, and uh, may have been meat that had been sacrificed to idols, and there's a, a debate going on uh, within the congregation. It's, it's dividing the church. Can we eat meat or not? And um, Paul says that uh, it's an this is an example of an action that, depending upon the motivation and the understanding of the person that's eating the meat, might be okay, but it might not be okay. What's your motivation? And so he says in Romans 14, verse 23, whatever is not of faith is sin. So if I'm meeting eat just to show you that I can eat meat, you weak need. Oh, sorry, Brian. You, uh, you, you, uh, Brian's had some knee difficulties. It's from his old hockey career uh, this past couple of weeks. Um, you, you know, then, yeah, there's nothing wrong with me eating meat, but what's my motivation? In Philippians, another example. Uh, and this one may, uh, may be familiar to you. Paul says that there are people, there were people in his day, and there are people in our day, that preach the gospel out of evil, selfish motives. Their actions are good. They're preaching the gospel. And so are the consequences. People are coming to faith. Good, good. Check off, check off. Christ is preached. People are brought to salvation. But if their motives are evil, Paul says, the preachers themselves are not pursuing the good. So we go a little deeper, right? It's necessary to distinguish the good that is done by a Christian from an action that may appear to be good. It's like the proverbial boy that helps the little old lady across the road. The external action is very good, helping an elderly person across the road. The consequences are good. She gets across the road safely. But the motivation may be less so because there's a good deed award waiting at school. Or maybe others will see the boy helping the lady cross the road, and that's his motivation. 
virtues and motives matter. If you fast, if you give, if you pray only to be seen by others, Jesus says, going back to the Sermon on the Mount, then you have received your reward in full. What's your motivation? The biblical teaching is that all three of those components are important in determining whether something that we do is good or moral. What is the nature of the action? What are the effects or the consequences of that action? And what's the motivation behind the action? But since the actions and the consequences or the effects of those actions all flow from the virtues or lack of virtues, our motivation, to use another term, then I think for Christians, the reason why we do good always comes back to what's in our hearts, the virtues, the motivation. If I am truly virtuous, if I have the mind of Christ, then my deeds will be good, irrespective of the situation at hand. It's all about, I think, character formation. You know what the real goal is for all of us. Until the day that we die and, and are in the presence of God, it's growing that fruit of the Spirit. I have become more and more convinced of that for my life. And I remind myself, it seems so dumb, but I have to remind myself that fruit, I've never seen an apple just poof on a tree. It takes, starts, it starts as a flower, it starts as a, less than a flower, I don't know what you call it, a bud, then the flower, and then it fruits, and then there's an apple. And that reminds me that the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's going to take time, maybe a lifetime. But it's about character formation. Because the real goal for you and for me is to cultivate the fruit of God's Spirit. It is to be clothed with Christ and reflect God's goodness. You can go through that list of the fruit of the Spirit and you can say, God is love, God is joy, God is peace, patience, kindness. And since God is love, maybe the chief virtue, and I think, I think, uh, you know, in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, love is mentioned first. Some wonder if we should read or understand the fruit of the Spirit as Paul saying, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, dash, and love is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And the greatest of these, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, is love. And so it seems that the chief virtue the, motive, the key motivation for all that we do as Christians is love. Enough of God's image remains in us that even unbelievers recognize that people should be good. And for Christians, though, the reason that we pursue what is good is deeper than that. It's deeper than just so we can have a good life, we can be happy. Being good is not just about uh, because everybody else is doing good. It's not just about uh, conforming to whatever society around us says is good, social norms. It's not, it's not even about keeping the people around me happy, keeping them off my back, pleasing people. That's why I do good. It's not about avoiding punishment. It's not about bad consequences if I don't do good. 
It's about living the best possible life out of love and putting others first, putting others before self, that self-sacrificial love of God. It's about being the people we are made to be. Being good is ultimately about the imitation of Christ crucified. It's about being conformed to his image and becoming like the God who created us in his image and his likeness. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When we taste and see that the Lord is good, then we want to partake of that goodness. The imagery here is interesting. You remember, maybe it was just the last, maybe it was supper last night. Put on the table and you look at it. I want to taste that. I want to become like the Lord who is good. And then we will thrive. And we'll, we will thrive when we fill our lives with the things of God. And our hearts and our minds need to be transformed by the power of God's Spirit. And we need to pray to that end. That God's Spirit, the fruit of God's Spirit, will grow and mature in my life. Our character and our virtues, our motivations, need to be shaped into the image of Christ. And so as Christians, when we talk about why we do what we do, we emphasize not the rules. We don't talk just about the consequences. We talk about character. To act in harmony with good character. That's the heart of the good life. And when we grow in moral excellence, when we grow in love, then good actions will almost always bring about good consequences. We don't know all the situations, right? And there's going to be cases that we're going to encounter in life that we have to really ponder. We have to really think about and consider. But we want to cultivate the virtues, the fruit. We want to seek the mind of Christ. And that's why we are good, why we want to do good as people of God.